Good day. I hope my microphone is working. Does it work? Can you hear me? Maybe this one is better. Hello. I will ask everyone to take your seats and keep silence if possible. Because while sitting here, it's hard for us to hear each other at this table. I'm Tihan Zietko. I'm the editor-in-chief of Dost TV. I'm thankful to to the hosts for, for a chance to moderate this panel and for this conference in general, for what we have heard yesterday throughout the day and what we're hearing during this panel. I think this is endlessly important. The topic of our panel discussion is very broad. Represented here are seven people. So on one hand, we will try to follow the timing regulations. Please uh, stick to five to six minutes, and later we will be able to listen to comments and questions from the audience. The topic is the deepunization of the state, the process of lustration and reforms on one hand, and also in this topic, defining by the West of the criteria for Russia to be accepted as democracy. So up to a point where now we are now taking some nice uh, time machine going to the day tomorrow or after tomorrow when we are not trying to think what to do about the present but about constructing this new Russia. And although for many, partially also based on yesterday's conversation, this time machine might seem unrealistic, apparently in Moscow they are preparing for it quite rapidly. If we see what propagandists are saying, they are increasingly using the narrative that if Russia loses the war, everyone will suffer, everyone will be punished and infringed on their rights. Starting with the ruling clique and going, going to the very bottom. Also during these days, and not only we are speaking about the need of deep reforms in Russia, some people say that these reforms must imply illustration, others say it shouldn't, but in this way or another we need some kind of deputinization. So during the first uh, part of um, our talk we should speak about the reforms, deputinization, illustration. We know that during 20 last years and especially last uh, 15 months the Russian government is doing the following it allocates the responsibility for its crimes on everyone and for the first time we have seen it during the Security Council session days before the full-fledged invasion where the decision made by one was presumably passed by 15 and we see it increasingly every day so we are speaking whether there is some universal formula to be discussed which would assume punishment for perpetrators and that this punishment does not produce huge resistance or revanchism because this is also possible. I will introduce the participants Alexander Morozov, the political scientist, Gennady Gutkov the Russian opposition politician, former member of the Russian state Duma, Alexandra Karmajapova, the co-founder, the head of um, Free Buryatia Foundation, Sergei Lagodinsky, a co-host, and MEP, the political uh, scientist Ekaterina Schulman, also Roland Freudenstein, is the security expert, and also expert in European integration, the Vice President of Globsec Brussels, and Ivan Priobrazhensky, the political scientist, uh, also next to us. First, I would like to ask uh, Ekaterina Schulman to start. Please try to stick to five, six minutes of timing, and then we will have enough time for comments from the audience. Dear colleagues, thank you for having me. 
and for providing us with this great platform for someone working on parliamentarism and uh, law-making. I'm particularly happy that we're meeting here in the European Parliament, in the heart of the European democracy. As a political scientist, I would say that what is happening is uh, called legitimization. This is the process of uh, gaining political agency, and this legitimization, according to the scenario, which is the most sustainable according to Max Weber, the legal legitimization by procedure. This is really an outstanding event. I would like to thank the hosts, in particular Sergei Lagodinsky sitting next to us and also Andrius Kobilius sitting in the hall. Thank you so much. The question asked by the moderator regarding the allocation of responsibility and uh, prospects for illustration, that's true. It's quite actively being debated in the Russian official discourse. And I think this is the stage of accepting the unavoidable, uh, uh, named by psychologists as uh, bargaining. This is the bargaining stage. Yes, the war is a failure, but some, somehow we should still win it, because if we lose, it will be bad for everyone. So, And even the cleaning servicemen who clean the Red Square will also sh 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 shall be sent to gulags. Illustration is an unpleasant topic, many people don't like it, and still it produces lots of uh, agitation. Frequently they confuse it with criminal responsibility. Criminals must be prosecuted. It's not about illustration, it's about justice, which is also quite challenging, especially in a situation when the very justice system promoted and encouraged crime, but it has nothing to do with illustration. If we check the historical experience of illustration of uh, post-war Germany, and post-Soviet countries of Eastern and Central Europe, we can see that lustration is a process limited in time. By the way, frequently it's seen something happening for ages. So now we will ban some bad guys from doing something. Illustration is announced for some um, clear period. This is categorical in nature and limited in application. For example, the law prohibits the officers of political police from standing from standing for election. This is one type of illustration. Or former judges are banned from working as judges for some period of time. So illustration is not decimation. This is some infringement on rights to certain groups and it's limited in time. Naturally, the question for each new political order, if it comes uh, to replace the old political regime, the question is how getting rid of all the bad guys serving the previous regime, how you can find new people who will be able, of wor able to work for the new regime. This was the problem for the occupying powers of Germany. Historically, the denazification process demonstrated that the, the denazification was the most enthusiastic in territories controlled by the Soviet Union, while American, English and French occupying powers quite quickly realized that they have neither resources nor chances to run them through some filtration processes. The millions of people, for example, those belonging to the Nazi party or serving in the German army. In the end, anyway, they go to some kind of compromise with which no one is fully happy. The only thing to say to comfort everyone is that on Earth, perfect justice is not, is not possible. And seek of justice quite frequently contradicts the ambition of civil coexistence, which is the primary value for many citizens. I can give one more historical example, which is frequently on my mind recently. Karl Löwenstein, the German lawyer and one of the fathers of the new democratic constitution of Germany, emigrated from Nazi Germany immediately after Nazi power ascent to power in 1933. He emigrated for the US 
where in 1941 the American Law Institute, the think tank and the American Ministry of Justice brought together the group of uh, German exile lawyers which was which had to represent the pre-Nazi German legal culture. I really like this uh, this phrase. This group was assembled in 1941 when the outcome of war was far from obvious. Still the American power, the American government believed it was important to bring these people together in a group to come up with drafts and developing the ideas for upcoming reorganization of Germany after the war. Karl Levenstein came to Berlin in uh, July 1945 immediately to smoldering ruins of the city and, the, and he started the illustration of judges. He was the author of the concept and practical implementation of the illustration of German judges. Among his other achievements we can note the arrest of Karl Schmidt, a well-known Nazi philosopher and also and also a jurist. And the decision back then was that the intellectual masterminds of the Third Reich also had to be tried, not telling the stories that they were writing books and uh, sharing their reflections, and it's not to be tried. So, so there were trials. Of course, they were not executed. They were imprisoned and they were released, and still he's quite a popular thinker in some communities. So Karl Levenstein came up with the concept of militant democracy quite confusingly translated to, to Russian. It's about militant democracy which is uh, capable of defending itself. Clearly, there is no constitutional text which can defend itself. It's not possible to write a constitution which is uh, immune to any violations, but there are certain mechanisms which might serve as safeguards. This is one of the aspects of the work to be done and which, in my view, we should start doing right now. The second aspect is about the continuation of the process launched by the conference in which we are participating. I would say this is the process of legitimization. The legitimization is followed by the stage of organizational structuring. Quite frequently, we, as some collective uh, community, although I don't think we are actually a collective community, but still we are expected to create some institutions. From the experience of this year, I can see that Russians in exile are very good in creating two kinds of institutions. One are the care institutions, care organizations like ARCA, like the ARC, Kovchek, or some other organizations. So the organizations which uh, take care of the newcomers, helping them to settle, providing legal aid to the people inside Russia and organizations taking care of people who need to relocate, if they need to relocate. And the second type of organizations in which Russians are good are media organizations. Russian media are really an example of uh, outstanding adaptiveness and survivability. They relocate and in very tough context they relaunch their activities. I will not name anyone, but this is an example which is worth respect. The political institutions are much more challenging. I think it's because the people are expected not exactly what they are capable of. The people who left Russia en masse and it was not their choice in large crowds in very short time. And we are inside this process and we are observing this process, we are a part of this process and it seems like we are not actually comprehending its scale. You don't have precise data but by rough estimates 600,000 up to 1.2 million people left Russia in one year between March 2022 and March 2023. In number it's more than the emigration wave of 1917-1922 or by the wave of post-Soviet emigration because 1917-1922 these were five years 1989-2002 there were three, 13 years so the numbers were similar but then the periods were much longer 
So the people who were running so quickly to save their lives and freedom, they are not capable of organizing themselves politically. On the other hand, I must uh, remind everyone that the European Parliament on 5th April 2022 adopted a resolution on European Parliament's attitude uh, towards uh, anti-war opposition of the Russian community. And the first provision in this resolution was to appoint a special representative of the European Union for relations with pro-democratic Russians, both outside Russia and also inside Russia. I am aware, and probably I will not uh, reveal some secret, that although this point of this resolution and like any other points of this resolution were not implemented, it is still being discussed, and over these months of discussions the idea of appointing this representative transformed into an idea of uh, appointing an ombudsman for rights of Russians, Russians in Russia and Russians outside Russia. We must understand that Russians outside Russia actually are stateless people. Their state is either dysfunctional or directly hostile against them and openly declares the intention to do something bad to them. So they cannot approach this government for normal public services. At the same time, anti-war Russians inside Russia are also deprived of any representation in Russia or outside Russia. Let's be reminded that in 2020, 2021, in 1920, 1921, the League of Nations, when the government in Russia was either dysfunctional or illegitimate, while there were many Russians abroad 100 years ago, this is when the League of Nations established the Commission, the commission of Nansen, which developed a number of measures both legal and political, which enabled to legitimize these people. At this new historical stage, I think it would be very helpful if the European Parliament read its own resolution and heard the voices calling on and asking to take uh, this problem into consideration. And if this ombudsperson is appointed, and if the European Parliament votes for it, could not only serve as the defender of rights of Russians outside Russia, but also a negotiator on behalf of anti-war Russians and representatives of Russia at international tribunals, extensively discussed here. So who will represent Russian citizens at those tribunals? Clearly, the Russian Federation will not participate in it. This person could participate in, in uh, swap talks. Probably that's the only form of interaction taking place between Russia and Ukraine and also the external world as such. I know that such talks are being discussed about appointing ombudsperson. I will not uh, mention the names without their consent, but I know that the human rights community of Russia and human rights defenders, who are also mostly outside Russia, by this I mean people who are the heads of memorial and also my former colleagues from the Human Rights Council, they also support this idea. So I've decided to tell about it from this, um, from this stage because many of you know about it, partially or fully, but I, hope, I think that at this stage and at this moment we can already speak about it openly. And I also find this uh, idea important and worth supporting. If implemented, this idea will offer us some um, point of contact, certain focal point around which we can structure many other things. Again, this would not be a political representation, but this would be about defending human rights of Russians. So this was my point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I would like... Uh Roland Frundestein to take the floor because uh, I know that you will have to leave. I believe that you can hear interpretation. What I would like you to dwell on, because the second part of this uh, discussion is uh, criteria defining 
by the West the, of the criteria for Russia to be accepted as democracy after the situation changes in the Russian Federation. Therefore, I would like to ask you about the following. For those 20 plus years, we could see that the attitude of the West in the broadest sense uh, towards Putin and the regime has changed. We could see that for quite a while, despite all the things happening inside Russia, uh, the West continued uh, the dialogue with Vladimir Putin. And many of us uh, remember that after the war of 2008 against uh, Georgia, practically nothing was undertaken against uh, Russian leadership and Russian Federation, and some people believe that it was a prerequisite for Putin to decide to annexate uh, the Crimea and Donbass and then to start the war in 2022. So what mistakes were made by the West? What were the key mistakes not to be made again? after, as we hope, the situation will change in the Russian Federation and the people in the leadership of uh, the Russian Federation with whom the West uh, should be ready to talk to. Should there be the representatives of the movements and the people who we see in this conference room or the people who were near the leadership of Russia or who leaded Russia, the people who are not allegedly directly responsible for committing crimes, but they were close to the leadership of the country, will the West be ready to talk to them? Thank you, Tihon. Um, and um, when you ask me about the people in this room, I first of all would like to make you a big compliment, and that goes, of course, to Andrius Kubilius, Sergei Lagodinsky, and the other hosts and their teams that made this possible. But this has been said by many others. I have a special compliment. When I look at you, the Russians here, I somehow feel reminded of something between high school and the, and, and the Boy Scouts. And, the, of course, the wildest kids and therefore the most interesting conversations are to be had outside at the smoker's corner. So thank you for bringing life to this otherwise sometimes slightly, slightly boring place. <clears throat> Not the parliament, I mean the city of Brussels. <laughs> All right, having said that, <clears throat> Yeah, I will be brief because I have to be brief because I have a speaking engagement uh, uh, in half an hour. But you will hear some more of me this afternoon when I have a second uh, performance on stage. So, um, Tikhon asked you a question. What went wrong? I think, you know, spot the German, um, starting with intellectual matters here. There was an intellectual error. There was a system error. Um, in believing that, you know, yeah, Putin may be a bad guy, he may be a little bit hostile, but sooner or later this would sort itself out. You know, the rule of law, liberal democracy, uh, human rights, uh, free elections would sooner or later win the day, in Russia as well. And this, of course, is based on the otherwise completely understandable uh, feeling of, of, of fulfillment and, and, and triumph after 1989, 1990, 1991. The fall of the Berlin Wall, end of, end of uh, uh, state communism in most countries, and all that, uh, the end of the Cold War. And the relative ease with which Central European countries had transferred to democracies with the rule of law was then erroneously uh, taken as something that would happen in the rest of the world sooner or later as well. By the way, spoiler, I do believe it will. It's just going to take much longer. So that was, that was the intellectual error that was at the basis of the two big mistakes we made. 
and you are ref referring to the Putin era. So I'm really, I'm, I'm not talking about Yeltsin, I'm not talking about what the EU should have done or should not have done in the 90s. Um, I'm not really talking about the last 23 years. So two things went wrong. One was this idea that, uh, ah, there's a beautiful German expression, Wandel durch Handel, right? Change through trade. Um, some of us are still making that mistake vis-a-vis -vis China these days. Uh, but vis-a-vis -vis Russia, we have gotten rid of this by now, but much too late. So the idea was that by engaging Putin's Russia with big fat deals, most of all, of course, in the energy sector, we would uh, somehow bring about this, this positive development to, to rule of law and pluralist democracy. And I, you know, honestly, actually, one half of this project actually succeeded because this project always had two sides. From our side, it was the export of rule of law. From the other side, from Putin's side, it was the export of corruption. Well, I must say, that part really succeeded for some time. Again, I think it's over now. Uh, largely. I mean, uh, you know, again, my country, Germany, was, was really prominent as an example here. And we are coming to terms with our past, even about the last 20 years vis-a-vis -vis Putin. Uh, you know, we have a certain routine in coming to terms with our past, and it's been a, it's been a topic in this, in this conference for good reason uh, uh, about the future of Russia. But we are writing books um, journalists are doing deep research and there will be a parliamentary inquiry about what went wrong with this Wandel durch Handel and how instead of exporting the rule of law we imported strategic corruption. And the second and probably as grave if not even graver mistake was appeasement, political strategic security related appeasement. In other words responding to Putin's aggressions with a new offer to talk. Uh, and, and yes, many examples were given. The, the, the bronze soldier affair in 2007, the Munich Security Conference speech, the uh, aggression against Georgia in 2008. You remember the dictum maybe of Thomas Silvis, the former, former Estonian president who says 2008 should have been a wake up call, but we've been hitting the snooze buttons ever since on our alarm clocks. And, and that, um, that just puts it all in a nutshell. And the real shame was that even after 2014, when it should have been abundantly clear what was happening, even then, our dear German government, including Chancellor Merkel, insisted on continuing Nord Stream 2 actually continue, no, creating Nord Stream 2. It was, it was the whole thing was signed in 2015. So um, it, it, that, was, that was a colossal mistake. And I will, I will leave it at that, um, saying, just answering your question, what went wrong? And what has to happen in the future, we're going to talk about later on. But what went wrong were these two things, the belief that through economic engagement you can somehow bring Putin back to the right path, that totally backfired. It actually made things worse. Um, uh, and the other thing was the appeasement through uh, a constant um, uh, uh, responding to violence and aggression by dialogue. Uh, and this, this uh, 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 complete fetishization of of dialogue at any cost. So, uh, and I would have much more to say about the neglect of Russian civil society because that's for, for you guys here, but other people will do that. And I believe uh, just this one thing, last, last thought from my side, uh, this will also have to change in the future. And, and, and it, it, it's, it, you know, the fact that you're here today, yesterday and today, is, it, it should become uh, a regular habit from now on and, and we, we have to in the future uh, um, cooperate much more closely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you Roland. I, I know that you, you have to run but yeah. we'll see you here on the, uh, on the one of the next sessions, right? So, uh, thank you. Now, I would like to address 
I would like to address my second question, which uh, was going to Roland. I would like to ask the same question to Sergei Lagodinsky. The question is, uh, with whom the West, uh, in the broadest sense, and uh, Sergei Lagodinsky will have to be responding on behalf of the whole West, and maybe that's uh, the role uh, which causes no envious. Uh, who is going to talk to, and uh, with whom the West is not going to talk to, because there are beautiful colleagues with which we are here in this building, in this conference room. And uh, the la there are uh, the so-called representatives of the Russian leadership, uh, which uh, are kept in mind and uh, who try to, to stay away from the most horrible things uh, that are going on. To what extent the West uh, can and should discuss uh, the opportunities to talk to them, allegedly with Mishustin, the Prime Minister of Russia, or maybe this is not uh, acceptable, and this uh, brings us back to the discussion of illustration and deep Putinization. English, if I may, since uh, I'm a, a representative of Germany, and by the way, uh, just to, to start on a, on, a, on a personal note, I feel very comfortable here because this is usually my seat when we have sessions of legal affairs committee where I <laughs> am a vice chair uh, to be seated here uh, and um, on that note um, I sometimes realize how grateful and how privileged I am uh, and I thought this very often when I sit, sit down together with uh, Alexei Navalny in Berlin after he uh, woke up after uh, his um, uh, he, being poisoned, um, you know, I, I, I was born in the same country uh, and I'm not much better than anyone uh, sitting here, but I have this privilege of uh, doing politics because I have this privilege of living in democracy and having lived in democracy for 30 years. And for that I'm very grateful and I'm very, I feel very humble uh, towards many of you um, because you should have deserved this uh, privilege, and we should do everything uh, to make this possible, if not for you, then for your children and grandchildren. Um, so this was something that I wanted to, uh, to say because I think it's, it's important. Um, um, uh, to address uh, your, your question uh, very briefly, I, I don't think uh, that we can predict now with whom we will have to talk in the future. And this is one of the complexities in which we are living because uh, crises and multiple crises are complex. You cannot predict uh, what um, development uh, uh, will be in the future. And of course, uh, one of the red lines that you could imagine is you don't speak to murderers. Um, but history, unfortunately or fortunately, have shown us and demonstrated us that the uh, international community even spoke with murderers uh, and dealt with murderers and made deals with murderers. Uh, this would not be my personal preference, and I'm sure that me and my party will be enthusiastically against it um, as long as we're in the opposition. Uh, but then if you are in power, then you don't have a choice. Um, I think that uh, uh, if you ask most of the members of this parliament now, they will definitely say that nobody in power in uh, uh, Russia now uh, will ever be a partner uh, because uh, uh, they have blood on their hands uh, and what is happening today uh, with Kachovka um, is just one more, uh, one more example of war crimes and crimes against uh, people and crimes against nature that are taking place, but never say never. And that's why uh, this is probably not a very satisfying uh, answer to you. Um, it, history will show. It is important, one thing is important, is that when we speak with them, we don't forget their nature. When we deal with them, we don't forget and underestimate their nature. Um, this is something that happened, and this is to uh, continue on what Roland said, in the past. I think one of the uh, points where I also um, um, 
disagreed with, uh, and I was a social democrat for a while, uh, and, and, and Russia policies one, was one of the points in Germany, in Germany, not in Poland, um, was one of the points uh, where I uh, disagreed with my colleagues. Um, uh, they, I have a feeling that one of the reasons, one of the mistakes was they talked to these people, they made deals with these people, but they never reflected on the nature of their counterparts. They never reflected uh, on the fact that these counterparts were already then murderers since uh, the Second Chechen War or since uh, this, the first invasion in Georgia. And they never reflected on the fact that many of them uh, came from a system that nobody in Germany would agree to talk to the system of secret services. And this is something when I talk to my uh, Eastern German uh, voters, I, um, uh, I explain to them, would you tolerate uh, someone who was member of Stasi? Uh, not an informal, uh, uh, an, not an informant, but an officer of Stasi to be president of democratic Germany. Um, for me personally, this was very clear from the very beginning, this cannot go well. Um, and uh, for many in the West, this was somehow forgivable and forgettable. And this is something, uh, if we're talking about what discussions and how the discussions should take place, I think the discussions should take place, you never know with whom you, with whom you discuss, but always remember uh, the nature of, of the partner that you have and that you cannot have trust uh, uh, in those people. I don't believe in regenerating and, and forgiving those who uh, are responsible for genocidal attack uh, that we're having uh, here. Um, I know that everyone spoke longer than, than, uh, than, than your questions actually were. Um, uh, I just wanted to maybe uh, address one, one issue, and which, which is the title um, of this. Uh, and this is the, the question of, well, basically this, this panel, from my understanding, is what is the transformation of Russia um, that we would trust uh, in the international community? Um, and I think uh, a lot of people are start talking about uh, justice reforms, something that we discuss on multiple levels also within the uh, European Union or uh, on, on, on various issues that are very technical. Uh, but I think one, one important point is the transformation uh, of self-understanding as a society. Uh, and I know it will be probably, it will sound a little bit too strict because these are things that we don't even expect from people who join EU or NATO, but uh, this overcompensation is because there is so much to compensate for that happened and what was done by the Russian Federation for now. Uh, and I think one, one important point is, uh, and I don't want to, um, to offend anyone, um, but from my observation, uh, one foundation that the Russian society, that allows so many um, crimes, so many wrongdoings in the name of Russia, is um, a, a, it's a wrong culture of self-reflection, I, I would say. It's a, it's a culture, and many, many experts would probably correct me, but it's a culture where uh, it is about being a victim instead of having empathy to others. Um, and um, uh, th this, is, this is something that th the society will have to go through uh, before uh, we will talk about uh, all the technicalities. Uh, I think one issue that will be important uh, is uh, dealing with uh, uh, minorities uh, and uh, how to uh, discuss, and I'm sure that this will be addressed here, and, and how the Russian majority and also Russian opposition or the opposition who will be in the in in the uh, in power then uh, will deal uh, with uh, minorities and regions uh, in Russia. This will be something that we will be very closely watching uh, from the from outside of Russia. Uh, I think that the issue of dealing uh, uh, with gender uh, topics and women's rights, something that I know also. Um, Something that we also maybe should self-reflect as organizers of this conference. This is, uh, um, uh, I, I say this. Um, but, 
but I, I do think that these are markers, and I, I mean, this probably sounds populist now, but I, what I, what I mean it, I, I really mean it. I think these are markers uh, on, on which we will be looking at from the outside, and I know that, you know, uh, the, the, the society, in, I don't know when na names, you know, we have problems with women's rights and the Istanbul Convention is not adopted in many of our member states, but again, um, when, you went th when you have a country that went through a genocidal criminal past, we will be especially looking at these uh, issues because this will be a special markers that will t show us whether this transformation is complete or not complete. Um, on any other issues, or, um, we, can, we can discuss them later during, during the discussions, but these were the points that I think were important. Thank you very much, Sergei. And uh, now I would like Alexander to take the floor, considering that uh, Sergei uh, mentioned it a minute ago. I would like uh, to know your opinion, how you see. Well, we could see in the last 15 months what happens when there are those who believe uh, that they could dictate uh, the conditions and uh, when they have the situation in which they set uh, these conditions. Uh, so they take uh, more uh, sons uh, from uh, certain areas and send them to the war. I'm speaking about Buryatia in Russia, but not only about them. How do you see these relations with the center? Or maybe you do not uh, see any center here anymore at the previous panel. Uh, there was uh, uh, the phrase uh, decomposition of uh, Russia. Will it be a benefit or not, and whether this is realistic? First of all, I would like to, to say hi to all of you, and I would like to welcome you and thank you for the opportunity to, to be speaking inside the walls of the European Parliament. Uh, this is a privilege uh, to a certain extent, and this is extremely important for minorities for ethnical minorities uh, in Terale, about which I'm going to be speaking uh, in the agenda. We are speaking about deputinization, but we should be speaking about de chauvinization because uh, the challenges we are facing today, the imperative, uh, uh, the imperial narrative, emerged not uh, during the times of Putin. We have been talking about these challenges for ages. The previous presenter of the previous panel, Mark Fagan, was uh, saying it's difficult to alter imperial mindset, but he said Russian immigration, Russian people, Russian society, and you see it and you do not understand whether you are included here or not, because we insist that it is critically important about uh, uh, it's critically important to speak about russian citizens and not russians the previous uh, presenters were speaking about asia in the negative sense but i'm sorry it seems to me that south korea or japan are also asian countries and i think that russia has uh, things to learn from these countries and we can be speaking about Mongolia. Mongolia, according to Freedom House, is among the countries with a high level of democracy. So again, referring to Chinggis Khan is not relevant uh, for Russia in its situation. I would like to say thank you very much, distinguished colleagues, who have been speaking a lot in recent days about uh, the rights of indigenous people ethnic minorities, and I would like to be speaking as a person who was born in Beratia but grew up in St. Petersburg. I love St. Petersburg. I'm thankful to this city, and I always stress that I have never faced uh, racism at school, university, among my friends. I had a good environment. However, when you are in a public transport or in public places, quite often I could hear, go to your China, go to your... Uzbekistan, and every time you have to prove that you are part of this state and uh, your protection is uh, your 
accentless uh, speech. You should not have an accent in uh, Russian when you speak Russian. And uh, when I heard that Ukrainian is a dialect of Russian, uh, that why do you pronounce uh, G and uh, she sounds in your Ukrainian way? So this is like a superior attitude towards Ukraine. This uh, is uh, what has been going on in Russia, in the Soviet Union for decades. We should also speak about that. But if we speak about new Russia, no matter reforms we are discussing, we should be speaking about the mistakes of the past. And we should not be afraid to be accountable for them, because it's strange to say that uh, Russia won the Second World War and uh, the tanks in uh, Czechoslovakia were brought in by the Soviet Union. Uh, this is a uh, 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 ambiguous thinking, and we should be speaking about that. However, this is not pleasant. Uh, next, I would like to say we should uh, recognize the problem of racism in Russia in general. Why many are surprised uh, how this national movements emerged, uh, why this is so relevant today, it was an initial answer to the rhetoric of the Crimea, which decided to denazify Ukraine. And uh, and then what about the denazification of Russia? Then I announced a flash mob, and about 4,000 people were part of it. Udmurt Chuvash, Karel Maria, these are the eth ethnic minorities so, which had not been facing racism as it had seemed to us, but... Uh, they were saying that their grandparents uh, were shy to be speaking their native languages. They tried to be speaking uh, Russian without accent. And they were putting uh, in their passport applications uh, that their uh, nationality was Russian. But I think that the most optimal way for us is federalization. Why? I will explain. First of all, if we look at Buratia, in Buratia 70% of the people are Russian-speaking, 30% of them are ethnic Burats. If we make a democratic referendum, then it is unlikely that the Russian population will vote for independence, and it seems to me we should be speaking about that. I do understand why Ukraine wants Russia to disintegrate. It seems to them that it disintegrates and the empire disappears, but we are saying that there will be a huge number of small countries with nuclear weapons, and it's a great challenge for all. And I think it's critically important, uh, the following. Uh, Vladimir Putin, in his rhetoric, says that if, if not for him, then Russia disintegrates. If we promote this agenda, then we play in favor of Vladimir Putin. I am convinced that Vladimir Putin is afraid of real federalization because this is more likely and feasible. And in principle, we should promote, in my view, this agenda. And uh, wrapping up, in order not to to delay my presentation, just give me a second. We should make an inventory of history, recognize historical mistakes, uh, support uh, national languages, and stop uh, looking at the regions uh, as a, a superior nation. Okay, they say, you are Burats. We do not know famous philosophers and writers uh, from your nation, but uh, okay, if you concentrate all culture and education and the headquarters uh, and in capital cities, then you will not see the development of the regions in this regard. Maybe this sounds uh, 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 popsic here, then uh, uh, Russia is a multinational country, but we would never see any ethnic minorities uh, being the, the protagonists uh, in, in uh, movies. Uh, they usually play the roles of uh, some auxiliary personnel, cleaners, uh, uh, and... Uh, 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 and uh, this is a xenophobic policy uh, in Russia, and people do not know anything about one another. And uh, the, when my friends from uh, Varonish ask uh, me whether uh, Dagestan requires visas or not, then I don't know what to say. Uh, we should explain that. Uh, this is a big country, and it's interesting, But uh, and we should leverage this uh, potential if we leverage it in the right way. Thank you. Gennady Gutkov, please take the floor and return to the conversation about lustration 
and the reforms. Alexandra has mentioned Putin repeatedly, and we know that this person most likely stands behind this so-called special military operation together with military bosses and State Duma members voted for this operation and they also helped uh, to choose dozens of thousands electron commissioners rigging elections for decades. In this way we understand that all these operations of different uh, level of uh, bloodiness, dozens, hundreds of thousands or millions of people were engaged. What should we do about it? Thank you so much. Undoubtedly, that's the case. I'd like to start with uh, thanking MEPS, Andres Kubilius and his colleagues, and Sergei Lagodinsky present here for having us all here in this room. This might be procedure-based legitimization, which is a very useful process. I would like to speak uh, that this process should continue, because this procedure is nice, but it's not enough. Yesterday, someone called this conference uh, historical. It can be really a landmark event with two conditions met. First, if the work continues, and second, if the Russian opposition and democratic forces are capable to coordinate some groups and bodies to join this working process, then this will be really a landmark conference. We are somewhat rushing and we are discussing the day after, as if it's really coming tomorrow. But we all are living today and there is just one night between today and tomorrow. So let's discuss this time between today and tomorrow. We are speaking about immediate deputinization. It is uh, stated in the declaration signed by most people here. It says that the regime of Putin is illegitimate and criminal and has to be liquidated. How will we liquidate it if we have no plan? With whom will we do it? Whom will we engage? So will we wage the war or will we go with a rally to the Kremlin? No, the question to the members of the European Parliament who already came up with an answer in private conversations. Is Putin a party to the upcoming peace talks? MEPS say no. Sergei Lagodinsky has just said we will see, at, we will act ad hoc, we cannot predict the future. So if we don't have some clear plan for liquidation or replacement of Putin's regime, all these nice steps such as lustration, the constitutional reform, federalization, women's rights, national minorities' rights, this will be just wishful thinking, a dream. I might, not, I might sound quite pessimistic because I'm giving the question to the European Commission. Look, what is the West's plan vis-à-vis -vis Russia? What will we do after the war? It's clear on Ukraine. Aristovich said it. Give more weapons, not to have military defeat, but overwhelming defeat. And this is what we need to do. But if Putinism remains, what is the tomorrow? Tomorrow might be horrible the country turning into North Korea with 6,000 nuclear weapons. Kukli Kim had, has six nuclear warheads and no one dares to attack him. And we have 6,000. How will we address this issue? How will we organize the illustration? How will we be able to restore the rights of the nations? There is no way. So now the West is the key actor in this situation has to make a decision, because the Biden has said Putin cannot be kept at power and the State Department tried somehow to soften this, but he told the truth. As long as Putin is in power, there will be no peace. There will be only a short truce. And next will come Kazakhstan, Georgia and Armenia. Or am I wrong? 
and then they will just see the situation. Psychologically, Putin is not ready to use the nuclear weapon. We understand this. He doesn't have the bunker which will withstand the contemporary nuclear blow. But in 2014, he was not yet ready for full-fledged invasion of Ukraine. He was not ready, but in 2022 he was, and he did it. So if we don't defeat the Putin's regime and we don't liquidate it, as it is said in this declaration, we will not succeed. And all these wishes will just remain a fairy tale. This is why we should be in the dialogue, creating task forces. Russia is not included anywhere. Discussing sanctions, Russia is not included. So some sanctions are okay and others are rarely wrong. We are not discussing how to oppose propaganda, because as Muratov said, if on one hand we have uh, engineers and on the other we speak about bands, how will we do it? So we have to agree, Ukraine, the West, Russia, and if we decide that Putin's regime should not exist anymore and the second stage of the war, it might not be the hot war anymore. Yes, there is no way to occupy Russia as it was with Germany and to clean up the bunker. The nuclear shield removes it from the agenda. It means we need other other measures. We need, like Alexashenko said, carrots and sticks. Who will eliminate Putin from power? Those who are in the country, which means we need to find allies there. This might be elite coup d'etat, which means we need to find allies inside elites. For this we need stick and carrot policy, which will work very well. It should not be started today, but yesterday or even the day before yesterday. So today we need to have this very clear plan for this night, separating today from tomorrow. If we are capable of doing this, we will build Russia of the future, democratic Russia, which will become the part of the European continent. It will come back to the European continent, becoming a free democratic country, or maybe the NATO member in some time. This is why I'm talking to the members of the European Parliament. Madame Merkel meant, uh, met the Russian opposition, so I have met Madame Merkel. The ministers of foreign affairs of Western countries would meet Russian opposition in all times, and I was among those participants, when I was no longer in the Duma or nowhere. So now, we don't have the leadership of the European Parliament here. Well, we had the Vice President. So far, they don't... Uh, they are too cautious to meet Russian opposition, because who knows, maybe later we will have to talk to Putin, and he will say, how dare you to be in the same room with them. So we need to take sides. Maybe the West actually understands that uh, victory over Putin is instrumental for peace, security, a new architecture of state security, a normal UN organization. It is essential for all of these things. Or, we as Russian opposition and democratic forces, maybe we have lived our lives in vain because Putin remains in Kremlin, which will produce decades of threats, wars and catastrophes, and a direct threat to the entire human civilization. 6,000 nuclear warheads. This is what we have to decide in the process of work. For this we need working groups on sanctions, on media, on some other things to create them in the European Parliament, or maybe in PACE. So look, the problem of refugees, asylum seekers, running away from Putin, hundreds of thousands, they don't have any status. And today, Mikhail Khodorkovsky has mentioned during the working group meeting, 40,000 people might be deported from Kazakhstan back to Russia. They will be sent to concentration camp, for sure death. In Europe, we are not working on it, because we are not there. Can Europe, or the Council of Europe, PACE, make an agreement with Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan and Turkey to provide some status to Russian refugees, at least some temporary humanitarian status, and there are many such issues. So I'm calling on the members of the European Parliament, you are doing a great job, you are doing this great event, I think this is the best in years, so I suggest that we make step forward. Next step, let's get back to the working level, let's work on a regular basis. We are ready to work as your advisors and experts. Please invite us to all discussions about war, peace and Russia of the future. And we are ready to work together for a common outcome. I believe that Russia will be free, it will be democratic. 
Not only we will see it, but we will also contribute to it. So best of luck, and uh, I wish everyone victory. Thank you, Gennady Gutkov. We have two remaining speakers, and it would be good if we had um, some questions from the room. So please, Ivan and Alexander, please be brief. To follow up on uh, Gennady Gutkov, um, maybe there is no point in discussing the day after, when the night we don't have the night yet. Well, we have the night, but it's not going to end. So what about getting out of this uh, nice uh, time machine and putting more efforts on today rather than building some illusionary illusionary future of some unclear context. Thank you. When I saw the name of our panel on the agenda, I thought that I would uh, I would not need much time. I would speak that immediate deputinization is the same as slow deputinization, but extremely nervous one. For quite many years I've been attending roundtables of such sort and large conferences. And I have this very strong impression, which I want to share before answering Tikhon's question. So what is new? There have been great conferences by Khodorkovsky, Kasparov, Free Russia Forum, playing an important role in maintaining certain climate over quite a long time, at least for almost a decade. But just one year of this war resulted in so many people leaving, leaving Russia, and on this side we can even say that we have journalists, we have people representing some reflective instruments, they are all outside Russia. So when I look into this large frame, it seems to me is that we have some large-scale, not articulated public movement. The movement, including different behaviors and different groups, with different issues, but still the feeling is that the war rephrases the question. I'm not speaking about unity on, or some political consolidation, but just about seeing each other. And for myself, it might sound paradoxical, but for me, if I walk around, we see the feminist anti-war resistance with their issues and agendas, while on the other side, we have the people who want to fight on the side of Ukraine as a part of, Ru of Ukrainian troops, which is also quite significant. And this is just one spectrum, including human rights organizations, which now are on this side, and also cultural groups mentioned by Roman Liberov during this conference, and so on. I will not list all the sectors contributing to this new situation. While we speak about deputinization, of course I don't belong to the ranks of optimists. I don't think that this is a close horizon. We all are in favor of Ukraine's victory and Russia coming back to borders of 1991. But uh, the defeat does not produce another chance of democratization in itself. The second democratization chance is a huge problem because most likely and in this, partially, I share the opinion of Andreas Kobilius and many other political experts that such large-scale events mostly are associated with some global change. The previous democratization waves in which Russia appeared to be included don't, are not produced by internal developments, 
they are rather produced by global context. In this regard, we might be waiting for some global context which would move Russia forward. How will, we, how, how will it affect it? This might be movement towards some new borders. Maybe this will be a different kind of federalization. Anyway, this will be some new large process. What can we do about it today in this regard? I'm quite positive about the potential that we have on this side. We have not seen it in 10 years, the way the potential, intellectual and cultural potential and activist capital that we have on this side of the barricades. I think that if we preserve it, if it keep, if we keep this energy, it is not likely to be participating in deputinization in 10 years, but still developing this leverage creates some prospects for us. Developing this strong intellectual, cultural, activist, civil leverage on this side. Can we use this leverage to affect those who are back in Russia? This is frequently discussed by our media colleagues working with their audiences. My touch on it is that even if this influence is highly limited and this gap might be growing because leavers and remainers, we should not draw some pessimistic conclusions from it. Because when we have the next chance for democracy, whenever it comes, this leverage will work. It will do its thing. I'm sure it will. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you so much for having me. I will address the last question. How the West should develop criteria? And also what colleague Garma Zhapova has said. Is Asia good or Asia bad? Asia is diverse. Who will define how Russia will be will be changing? The West? We don't see any criteria from the West. Thank you, Andres Kubilius and Sergei Lagodinsky for having us here. And Andres mentioned yesterday that the European Union needs its own criteria of the Russia they want to see. So far they don't have this criteria, and we clearly see that they don't. And Sergei has said today that maybe it's not actually clear how these criteria should be developed. But in this situation it's highly prob it's highly likely that someone else will be dealing with transforming Russia. There are powers in the world capable of transforming Russia, which have resources to transform it from inside, if need be. We understand that so far this is just a virtual threat. There are no attempts from China yet, but I think the European Union needs to take it into consideration and the West need to remember that they are not the only players, not only they have interests vis-a-vis -vis Russia, and if they don't have some clear stance with which the democratic Russia can show solidarity, at some point this stance will be shaped by other people, probably sharing different ideologies. That's number one. Number two, Without occupation or deoccupation, illustration is not possible, let's be honest. Yekaterina Shulman was very good in describing possible options and scenarios of illustration. I have nothing to add to it. Yet I would like to say that illustration in Russia will not be possible by, by Russians if there is no occupying power. The Russians will not do it themselves. We have two examples, which are normative for me. First, the illustration of police bodies in Czechia and the illustration of interior system in Poland. These are two different models. And unfortunately, the Czech example is not possible for today's Russia, which is the full ban 
from keeping some positions by former security officers and police officers and building some new institutions from scratch. The Polish scenario in which this gradual transformation with adopting new legislation and coming into power of people sharing new democratic values and also working with the old apparatus which is fading away without being capable of working in this new context the way it happened at Poland probably is the only theoretically possible option for Russia as we think about what is possible for Russia. The question came from Tikhon. What should we do about millions of people engaged in crimes of the regime? And I think the answer to this question actually is provided by Hannah Arendt because it's about contemporary Russia being the strong example of triviality of evil, which we see every day. But this is opposed by some trivial good. We are discussing about people opposing the regime but also there are people who are confronting the regime every day by sabotaging its edicts or by opposing these edicts or by being bad in implementing these edicts while still fulfilling them. And these are the people with whom we will have to work when Russia has to transform itself. What is the path for interaction with these people? We don't have bridges to cooperate with them. Let's admit that even democratic independent media in Russia, especially given the context of Russia, they work in a bubble. They try to go beyond this bubble, but it's very problematic. There is no way to reach out to these audiences without some horizontal organization. But this is crucial to change their mentality and their thinking by the time when some change comes, so that we also have some group in Russia on which we can rely to implement change. And the brightest example about emigration or relocation, some people don't want to call themselves emigration, so they call themselves rel relocants. So I think it's about building the platform of anti-war initiatives which started almost a year ago, started with Prague, then Berlin Congress, then the working meeting, for which uh, we greatly thank Mikhail Khodorkovsky. But now it's already shaped, because it's the most representative uh, association of Russian activists, included, including dozens of organizations working in Russia. And this is the bridge which we must, must use. With my full respect, Politicians don't serve as such a bridge currently, because they are also in their own bubble. And the last thing I want to say, we still have an example of Sir and Sergei Logodinsky. You have mentioned that we don't know with whom we will be able to speak in today's Russia. Unfortunately, we have an example of such a state. This is today's Afghanistan and Taliban regime with whom it's not possible to talk, but still it's not, it's not uh, possible not to talk, because someone controls this territory. And if there are no clear moral criteria of interaction with this regime, some monstrous things happen, because Taliban regime always uh, feels impunity. They are the monopoly. They have the monopoly, and... Uh, there is no one else to whom we can talk, but there are no criteria to use for talking with these terrorists. If we don't have such criteria vis-à-vis -vis Russia, then the position of the West will be as weak and valueless. We need some criteria in advance, at which stage we can talk to people. What is the level of engagement and involvement with Russian regime, with Putin regime, for talking? to these people. This must happen before the fall of Putinism. And the last, the name of our session, immediate deputinization. It's not possible. Actually, this is what I wanted to say in the beginning, and this is what I want to say in the end. Thank you. We have just a couple of minutes left. Maybe we still have some time for hearing one or two questions. Karina Moskalenko asked for an opportunity for a comment. 
Or has Sergei delivered your point? No, thanks. To follow up on Gennady Gutkov, that people from Russia can be given back to Russia. One emergency note, the complaint is sent to the European court. If we have some Polish participants here, please. Amran Navrozbekov cannot be granted back to Russia. He will be killed. Please prevent it today or tomorrow. Please prevent this from happening. Thank you for your attention. The second question, very quickly. You have already mentioned this point on uh, impossibility of some things in the political culture. The Russian human rights defenders, the Russian opposition and Russians in general are really bad in respecting the gender balance. Many people think that this is an artificial issue. Sincerely, they don't understand. Mostly it applies to the previous session because it fully included uh, male suits. And there were seven suits and we only had this uh, all-male session. I wanted to ask, are you feel cozy here? Don't you feel that women sitting here who work with human rights, those who every day and around the clock they take care of people trying to do something for new Russia, for future Russia. They don't understand you and you don't understand them. This is why I have one very concrete and very pragmatic proposal. Western politicians understand us very well. Dear Western colleagues, our men will not understand it anyway. They are brilliant. They are they are amazing, we love them, we respect them, but they cannot understand honestly. When next time we see all male panels, please let's leave the room, just for them to listen to us. Thank you. The women's issue is somewhere between animal rights and defending blue whales for Russian politicians. They just don't understand. Please help us, help them understand. They are good. We love them. What about the men? Do you want to stand up and support us? I can't stand up. It's my pleasure. The problem is that uh, having stood up, I need to announce that the time for this panel is over. Thank you so much for contributing. I'm very sure that uh, the point from Karina Moskalenko will also be taken into consideration. Unfortunately, we are out of time for this session. Can you hear me? Karina Moskalenko, is your microphone off? I don't know if you can hear me, probably you are not hearing me. I'm very sure. Just some silence, please. Unfortunately, the microphone is not working, so I have to shout. We don't have enough time for questions, although I saw many hands. I cannot speak on behalf of the hosts because I'm not among the co-organizers, but I believe that what Karina Moskalenko said will be taken into consideration by all of us when preparing next panel discussions and conferences. It, it will be taken into consideration by the suits.